Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Environmental Social Justice. I'm your host, Wendy Nystrom. Today's special guest is Greg Gephardt. He is the Executive Director of the Military Missions in Action. Welcome to the show, Greg. Thank you so much for having me, Wendy. Anytime. So you are doing very important work helping our veterans. This uh, this organization was started in 2008. How, how is this created and how did you get involved in this? Yeah, no, absolutely. Great question. So in 2000, late 2007, uh, retired Coast Guardsman Mike Dorman uh, from here in Central North Carolina, uh, he just saw the influx of um, veterans coming back from the surge in Iraq, uh, mm -hmm. and they were just overwhelming the VA system. Uh, the government was not prepared for this influx of all these injured uh, veterans coming home with, you know, a lot of them with physical disabilities, a lot with mental disability, you know, mental health impacts, uh, PTSD, mm -hmm traumatic brain injuries. And so Mike just felt called to do something about it. And so in late 2007, uh, Mike found out about an Iraq war veteran who uh, needed a new roof uh, on the coast of North Carolina. So he sold his Harley Davidson motorcycle, loaded up uh, his trailer full of uh, roof shingles and put the uh, roof on a veteran's house in Eastern North Carolina. That was the fall of 2007. And then he got the IRS uh, stamp as a 501c3 nonprofit in the spring of 2008. And for the past uh, 16 years, we've just been assisting veterans and their families all across the state of North Carolina. That's magnificent. That's a magnificent story um, for someone. I mean, I know how important Harley Davidson's are to people who have Harley Davidson's. So to just give that up and do something so generous as to help someone rebuild their roof. That's wonderful. And you guys have grown significantly. I mean, just real quick, a, a brief background. I mean, you would assist your veterans with disabilities, homeless veterans which we know no. um, that's a problem and that should never have happened. Um, members of the armed and their families. So not only veterans and members of the armed forces, but you help families. As yeah, well. absolutely. Uh, we changed our mission statement about three years ago uh, to reflect the families. Now we, we have always assisted when and where we could, but we, we codified it and memorialized it in our mission statement about three years ago because um, we recognize that family members serve just as much if not more than the veterans themselves. And just real quickly, I'll give you an anecdote about that. So I spent six years on active duty and then transitioned to the North Carolina National Guard. I've been serving in the North Carolina National Guard for uh, almost 12 years now. But when Hurricane Florence hit the Carolinas back in 2018, um, I got the call. I was alert, alerted. I was activated. And uh, so I called my wife and I said, hey, honey, the National Guard just called. I've, I've been alerted. And she said, well, are you going to um, Raleigh? Uh, you know, the headquarters or to Rayford, where the uh, the engineer unit that I command is headquartered. And I said, actually, I'm not going to either. I am going to Columbia, South Carolina. And she's like, wait, I'm, I'm confused. There's a hurricane that's going to hit North Carolina, but you're going to South Carolina? I said, yes. And, you know, we, we have to have a liaison officer down there to, you know, to work uh, border issues between the two states. And and so I literally, Wendy, handed her the instructions on how to operate the um, the generator and said, hey, I'll see you when I see you. And so I left my uh, wife and three young daughters uh, as a hurricane was bearing down on the state. And, you know, the easy part is uh, I know where I'm going. I know what I'm doing, what I'm doing. I'm given the uniform, right? I'm paid to do it. But how many times do people stop and think about the families that are left behind that this is uncharted territory for them, you know? And so, um, yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I remember when I uh, first moved to New York right before 9-11 happened and I was with an attorney working on an account and um, towers went down. And he just looked at his phone and said, got to go, because he was reserve. And um, the families basically had maybe 24 hours to deal with the fact that their their spouses were going to leave and go overseas immediately. So that is something a lot of people don't realize is when you are in the military, you are at a moment's notice, you must get up and leave. And yeah, we don't know no, when we come back. We don't know what the time frame is. So it's hard. Right. It's very hard. And tragically, you know, um, some don't come back. Right. Yeah. And um, pay the ultimate sacrifice. And it's those families that are left uh, to deal with that for the rest of their lives. And, you know, um, we have helped Gold Star families in the past. Uh, thank goodness uh, it hasn't been an overwhelming number. Um, but yes, there's a lot that we put on the families. Uh, and so we recognize that at Military Missions in Action and made it part of our mission. And, um, you know, we had a, a our Black Tie Gala. We did an inaugural uh, event this past weekend. And that was one of the things that that I told folks from the stage, like, we just, you know, if you're a veteran, that's enough for us. We don't need to know the terms of your service. We don't need to know where you served, when you served, you know, and if you're a direct family member of a veteran, again, we don't ask uh, the conditions of your service. Um, if you are eligible for VA benefits, 
you are eligible to be served by military missions in action to include your family. Oh, that's wonderful. And you guys have three, I mean, we're going to mostly focus on your transportation that you offer, but just real briefly, let's do a little background that um, you have Operation Building Hope, where you provide um, home modification services. That's yep. amazing. Um, could you go into a little bit of detail with that, Edwin? Yeah, absolutely. So Operation Building Hope, uh, you, you hit the nail on the head, Wendy. It's home <laughs> modifications to keep veterans and their families living independently in their homes, right? Because as they get, uh, you know, uh, up there in years, right? A lot of times they have to, you know, p potentially, uh, unfortunately, be moved out of their homes because of mobility issues or accessibility issues. We did a, uh, we redid a kitchen for a woman in Wilmington, North Carolina last year. Um, she had become disabled. She had lost one of her legs uh, due to, um, you know, an injury she sustained in service. And so now she had to be in a wheelchair, but her home was not built for someone in a wheelchair. So we widened some doorways through the, the help of a local uh, contractor in the Wellington area. Uh, we reduced the size of the island in her kitchen so she could get around her kitchen more easily. Um, but generally speaking, what that means to us, Wendy, the home modifications is we have two ramp crews that provide ramps, both permanent uh, wooden ramps and temporary metal ramps. But then anything above and beyond ramps, we, uh, we partner with local uh, contractors across the state to get that work done for veterans. And I can tell you, probably about 30 to 40% of the time, Wendy, we find a veteran-owned contracting company, and they either significantly reduce the cost for us because of who we are and what we do and who we help, or they just say, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll take this one, we'll eat this, it'll be an in-kind donation on our behalf. And so we're very blessed in that regard. So that's Operation Building Hope. Uh, and that's that's amazing because I don't think people realize just how prohibitively expensive it is to put in ramps and to modify kitchens and bathrooms to be um, dis disabled um, modification. Um, um, along those lines, Wendy, uh, I, I didn't mention this at the top, but um, one of the reasons Mike started this organization uh, was because of the backlog uh, through the VA. And, um, you know, our ramp program, if, a, if a, the, the VA has a, a ramp program as well, but unfortunately, there are just so many requests in the system that it often takes um, eight to 12 months to get a ramp for a veteran. We literally, uh, from the time we validate, you know, they are a veteran, they meet the need for our services. No exaggeration, Wendy, we can have that ramp uh, installed in less than 48 hours. And oftentimes we do. And so it's that immediate flash to bang. There's no wait, uh, red tape, you know, bureaucracy. No, we just go there. And so it's huge. Yeah. Yeah. You just get things done. It's that simple. <laughs> um, and Homes for Healing, though, um, this is where the environmentalist in me comes out is because you provide um, gently used furniture and household goods to veterans. That's keeping stuff out of landfill because people don't realize how much furniture is just thrown away. And it's perfectly fine, usable furniture. Yeah, I, um, I actually, uh, sadly, uh, I was driving down one of the back roads uh, outside of my neighborhood a couple weeks ago, and someone had just uh, strewn a bed, the mattress, the frame, the headboard, and I think uh, a dresser literally along some backcountry road, right, and disposed of it. And I actually literally got out and took a picture of it, put it in our newsletter last month and said, hey, if you have gently used furniture, uh, we give it to veterans in need. Call us. Don't just dump it on the side of the road. And yeah, I think last year we we diverted uh, over 200,000 pounds of gently used household items that otherwise would have ended up in landfills. Uh, we provided that to veterans in need. And the veterans in need, in large part, Wendy, that come to us for our furniture bank, our Homes for Healing program, uh, they come through the, uh, the VA's HUD-VASH program. And that is a program where they take veterans off the streets, give them a housing voucher, uh, secure them uh, a housing stable situation, but then literally the veteran doesn't even have a bed to sleep on. And then that, that's where we step in and we provide them whatever they need. You know, uh, we provide brand new mattresses. That's the only thing we don't use gently uh, used is mattresses, um, brand new mattresses, uh, you know, linens, uh, the nightstand. We do knives, forks, uh, the plates, cups, dishes, coffee makers, uh, washers and dryers if we have them available, microwaves the shower curtain, the plunger, whatever that better need, all the things that you need to make your house a home that you, that quite, quite honestly, we all take it for granted. We provide that free of charge to veterans. And, um, you know, again, about 30 to 40% of those uh, come to us uh, through the VA. Um, and you mentioned it, sadly, uh, we have so many unhoused veterans that are living on the streets that, you know, people tell me all the time, they say, Greg, you know, homeless and veterans should not, those words should never appear next to each yeah. other. Um, and so, um, but unfortunately, they, it happens. And, and we are glad to be able to walk alongside those veterans, get them off the streets, get them into a housing stable situation, 
Um, and so, yeah, that, that's our Homes for Healing program. I would think, um, cause I, you know, I do tons of interviews and I've talked to somebody who actually rescues furniture from hotels. I didn't realize how frequently hotels redecorate and just throw it away. So I think that would be a, a good collaboration with uh, some hotels and what you do. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's ironic or divine, however you view the world, uh, the, either way is fine. But um, I literally just got a call today from a gentleman who owns a, uh, several hotels all across North Carolina, from Wilmington to Charlotte. And um, to your point, Wendy, the, uh, I said, hey, I understand. Uh, I've learned anecdotally through the hotel industry that like they turn over their properties like every five to seven years. Right. And then I said, look, if you're willing to allow me, I will come get that furniture from you and give you a tax receipt. And he was like, wait, perfect. And, and it would go to veterans in need. I'm like, absolutely. He's like, yes, we can work on that. And please give me a call back. And so, yeah, now the other issue then arises, Wendy, you know, because we did this last year with a large property manager here in the Raleigh area, they bought a unit that was rented furnished, they were going to gut it and then re rent it unfurnished. And they said, Hey, we take possession of this place on Friday, we're gutting it Monday morning, whatever you can get out on Saturday and Sunday, like is yours. <laughs> But I didn't have any way to get it. Like we only have like one truck to pick up and move furniture, right? A, a 20 foot truck. So I literally, I, I got a, I called a farmer uh, in the county just south of us. And I said, hey, sir, I don't know you and you don't know me. But a mutual friend of ours said, if I reached out to you, you might be able to help us. And he was like, absolutely. Saturday morning, he had a 53 foot tractor trailer waiting on us. We put over 700 pieces of furniture in that thing. And and that was last uh, that was last summer, Wendy. And what that did is it accelerated um, our timeline to get veterans this furniture because prior to that, Wendy, we would have to do eight to ten pickups to mass enough furniture to do one delivery. And so, yes, you're absolutely onto something. We are chasing the hotels as we speak. Uh, I will put you in touch with any hotel that I come across. I will tell them all about you because what you're doing amazing work. And then the final thing, well, not the final, but. The last thing, last activity is fill the foot locker. I love that theory. I love that. I love the statement. I love everything you're providing people with um, hygiene, hygienic items, which most people, you, they, when you're homeless, you're not going to have toothbrushes and socks and underwear and deodorant. You're just not going to have that. Right. So you provide right. these. Yeah. So fill the foot locker. Um, absolutely. It, so it initially started with uh, care packages that we would send overseas to deployed service members. But, you know, as the conflicts overseas have kind of, uh, you know, uh, wound down with Afghanistan and Iraq, look, we still have uh, soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, Guardians in the Space Force all across the world, right? Even though we're not in, you know, in Iraq and Afghanistan like we were, you know, in the mid 2000s. Uh, but what we noticed, uh, Wendy, in addition to the food that we send overseas, you know, we do send some basic toiletry items, deodorant, shaving cream, razors that has huge crossover, as you just mentioned, into the unhoused community. Right. Yeah. Um, when we meet these veterans that are on the streets, to your point, they don't have access to uh, hand sanitizer, nail clippers, razors, shaving cream, um, you know, dry shampoo, uh, bug repellent, uh, insect repellent, sunscreen. Yeah. Right. Things that you don't think about. Um, so we collect all that stuff. And then. Um, we handed out, um, if it's going to unhoused veterans, we basically put it in like a large two gallon um, waterproof bag to try and give it some water resistance, you know, yeah. to include socks and whatever we might have on hand. If it's if it's the winter months, you know, we have a great group of, uh, we have a huge group of volunteers, but one group of women um, at a retirement community, they knit uh, scarves and winter hats for us. So in the winter months, we put those in there too. We handed out over 15, I think it was 1,529 bags last year across the state of North Carolina, um, all the way as far west as uh, Macon County, which is west of Asheville, uh, to oh, the right. coast um, down east. And um, yeah, and, and it's just a huge game changer for those uh, that are in those situations. Uh, so yeah, um, not only do we send toiletries overseas, but we give them to uh, uh, unhoused veterans on the streets all across North Carolina as well. Oh, thank you for clarifying, because at first I thought the, the fill the foot locker was primarily for unhoused people. I didn't realize it was also for military people still still serving abroad. So that's a good clarification for me. Um, and then your final thing that we're really going to dig into your transportation initiative. That's significant. Yeah, it is significant. <laughs> um, and so uh, I came on board here on January 1st of 23. So it's just been over a year. Um, and one of the things that I heard anecdotally as I was traveling around, meeting different people, talking to different groups was, um, you know, there's a lack of transportation assets to get veterans to appointments uh, at the VA. 
And, you know, I was like, wait a second, how is there a lack of access to transportation? I know that the VA had signed a, uh, a partnership or a collaborative agreement, if you will, with, I, I believe, Uber and Lyft, maybe some other ride sharing services um, to get veterans to their appointments. Number one. Number two, the disabled American veterans. I know the DAV has vans that they transport. And um, I finally met an om, uh, ombudsman at the VA here uh, locally in Durham, just north of us. And he said, Greg, yes, those programs do exist, but... Um, there's just not enough. The demand far outpaces the supply. And he said, I've been trying to see if there's a nonprofit out there would be willing to take on this transportation initiative. Um, and so I, I kind of put that in the back of my mind uh, early last year, um, about a year ago, and um, still gathered information, trying to find out. And, you know, one of the things that I've no I, I noticed over the course of last year, Wendy, was we traditionally had made a lot of deliveries through our furniture program to the urban centers, um, Durham, Charlotte, Raleigh, Fayetteville. But as housing affordability becomes more and more of an issue, right? These vouchers that these unhoused veterans are getting from the VA, their dollars just not getting them as far in the urban centers. So what we saw last year, Wendy, was these veterans are being put further and further from their treatment, which is in the urban centers because of housing affordability. So now, they're missing their appointments because they don't have the, they have a roof over their head now, right? And they're off the streets, but they're not, they don't have predictable, reliable transportation to get them to their appointments that unfortunately are in the urban centers. And so I was like, wait a second, all this hard work, energy, time, effort that we're putting in to get them off the streets, to get them the furniture that they need, to get them the wraparound support services, it's only a matter of time before that's all for not if we can't keep them healthy by getting to their appointments, whether that be, you know, a physical health appointment, a mental health appointment, a, you know, anything spiritual that they might need to remain well, holistic health, um, all these things. And so uh, I, I petitioned the state government last year and said, hey, would you be willing to give us a state grant so that we could pilot a transportation initiative to keep these veterans well, keep them in their homes with a roof over their head? Because I think in the long run, you know, a stitch in time saves nine. If we can keep them well and keep them off the streets, I think that's only going to lower healthcare costs for everyone, right? It's going to create less of a burden on the system. Uh, and so the state, you know, um, the state took a flyer on us and gave us a state grant. And so um, we hired a program manager. I actually just got our hands on the app uh, two weeks ago. So we have an app. It's called Warrior Wagon. Uh, where we will get veterans to and from their appointments. Now, initially, it's going to be very small, right? It's going to be a very controlled pilot beta test, if you will. Um, but I know once we release it to the masses, uh, um, I think the demand signal is going to be huge. Um, and, um, you know, obviously, we'll vet them, right? Like, hey, where are you going? Why do you need to go here? We've already, uh, our app on the back end already talks to um, to government servers to validate service through the VA. So, you know, um, so, yeah, but we're just really excited about that. And it, it nests well with what we do in terms of homes for healing, uh, as I said earlier, because if we can't keep them well. It's only a matter of time before they're back on the streets. And then we just yeah. have to repeat that process to get them their home furnishings again. And, you know, you, you nailed it on the head when you said a stitch in time saves nine, which goes to, you know, prevention, mitigation, whatever you want to call it. If we deal with something, you know, if we prevent it or if we plan to mitigate the risk before it happens, um, I actually have a good friend, a Vietnam veteran. He spent his 21st birthday in a foxhole and he's fine. He's, he's, he's doing very, very well, but he had an issue around the time COVID hit and all of a sudden depression and anxiety hit him. And fortunately he was able to get to the VA to meet with um, doctors on a regular basis, to walk through all of these emotions and all of these fears that crept back up 50 years later. Yeah. So this isn't like, oh, they're fine now. It's been 10 years. No. This is ongoing. This is something that we need to help our veterans continuously and honestly forever. It just, they gave, they gave us a service that many of us are unwilling to do. So they have earned that right to that healthcare, to that housing, to whatever we can possibly give them. Just my personal stance. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate you sharing that. And um, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to share this. Um, I wasn't prepared to talk about this today, but you know, you, you mentioned your friend who's a, a Vietnam vet uh, who 50 years later um, is having to deal with stuff that he experienced as a 21 year old or, you know, in his, in his late teens, early 20s. Um, you know, I, I'm an Iraq war veteran myself, um, you know, and admittedly, I, I was not on the front lines. I didn't experience, you know, uh, direct combat. 
Um, but, uh, you know, I, I lost a soldier uh, when we were over there under my command. Um, long story short, there were some things that happened along my uh, journey in the military that, um, you know, uh, unfortunately, I compartmentalized. Right. And, you know, I kept it suppressed and I didn't deal with it. And, um, you know, uh, it, it life happens. Right. And things happen. And then you start questioning, like, oh, why did I deal with this this way? And why is this? And, you know, um, yeah, yeah. I, I started seeing a therapist about four months ago. And what I've uncovered in that journey, uh, it took me a lot to get in there, admittedly. Right. But what I've yeah. uncovered in that journey is my formative professional years were spent in the military. And so I was um, I don't want to say indoctrinated. Right. But like I was professionally brought up and trained in an environment where, you know, unfortunately, sometimes you do have to compartmentalize stuff and deal with it or not deal with it. Right. And then it comes back up. And so I totally get what that Vietnam veteran saying. Yeah, he, he chose, you know, he kind of suppressed it, kind of compartmentalized it, kept it away. And then it just, you know, and it comes back in random times. It's not something you plan for. So, you know, this is something, a service that you are offering that is continuous and necessary and getting people to their appointments. I mean, I do know you had mentioned that sometimes with these services, they would say, okay, we'll pick you up at eight o'clock. I know your appointment's at noon. We'll pick you up. At, we'll take you home at 5 p.m. That's not okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for bringing that up, because that <laughs> one of the things I heard from critics of us trying to do this was, hey, Greg, there's already, you know, uh, I mentioned the other ride services and, and, and another organization that does it. But they said, Greg, on top of that, local counties across North Carolina have a transportation service, right? Where like you can call and request a ride. But what I've learned um, anecdotally from from folks who have used that service is exactly what you said, Wendy. They said, oh, your appointment's at 10 a.m. We'll, we'll, we'll pick you up at eight. Right. We'll, we'll have you dropped off there by 10 o'clock. But um, and I get it. Right. It's for efficiencies. And, and, and these yeah. these uh, county governments don't have a very robust bu budget. So what they do to gain efficiencies is what you just said, Wendy, they come back at like three, four o'clock in the afternoon, gather everyone up and then, you know, yeah. go back and, and drop them all off. And, you know, I said, hey, look, that might work for some veterans. But, you know, if, if they already um, they have a job or if they have obligations, it's not going to work. It, yeah, it's, it's difficult for them. Right. And I said, look, they, they might do that once. Right. But after they've experienced that one time, they're like, I'm never doing that again. Right. And then they probably just miss their appointments. And um, so, yeah. So thank you for highlighting that, because that's yeah. one refrain that I heard from critics as well. And the healthcare is the most important aspect of this, whether it's physical health care, mental health care. You need to go to your appointments. You need to follow up because prevention will stop the problem from getting worse. <laughs> I'm not laughing at you. I'm smiling because this is a lot of stuff that I've heard over the last couple of months in uh, seeking my own treatment. So, <laughs> yes. yeah, you know, I'm preaching to the choir right now. My husband's like, you don't go to the doctor. I'm like, shh. shh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's just it's a time commitment sometimes. But um, so if people wanted to hunt you down and find you and either volunteer, donate, get involved, expand beyond the Carolinas, how would how could they do that? Yeah. So military missions with an S military missions in action, all one word dot org military missions in action dot org. And then we're also on, you know, Instagram, Facebook, X, uh, LinkedIn. Um, yeah, you can find us anywhere on socials a, on our website. There's a link to my email address. I am more than happy to connect with folks. Um, you know, so yeah, just find us on socials or on the web. And, you know, folks often ask, Hey, Greg, you know, what can I do to help? And, you know, um, I, I usually when I give a presentation, I go speak to organizations or civic groups and share uh, who we are and what we do. Uh, I usually end with a slide that says how you can help. And it it has like 12 different things on it, Wendy. And right. Number 12 is if you could give. Right. If you can make a financial contribution. But I tell folks, if you can only do one thing, do one of these top three. And the top three are find us on social media and share our page. Sign up for our newsletter and forward that on to one person. You can sign up on our website for our newsletter. But then third, the, uh, the third of the three things I said, refer a veteran in need. I said, you don't realize it, but you work with veterans. Your kids go to school with veterans. You attend church with veterans. Um, you cross paths with veterans and organizations that you belong to. But if you wait for that person to come to and approach you and say, hey, I need help, you will wait forever because mm -hmm. veterans like myself are stubborn, right? We don't want to ask for help. We are trained to help others. We are trained to go to the sounds of the guns and know that others need help. We're very hesitant and stubborn and resistant and reluctant to raise our hand and say, hey, I need help. Um, and so there are veterans around you that you cross paths with every day that whether you realize it or not, 
probably could use help, but they're never going to ask for it. And just let them know, hey, I see you and I want to help. Um, and that means um, probably far more than you'd ever realize to a veteran. Absolutely. And you, you know, you're right. Um, veterans are a particular mind frame of they are there to be the helper. They are the ones that run into action. They are the one that make the ultimate sacrifices. So when it comes to saying, hey, you know, I could use a hand on something, generally they're going to say, no, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm here to help you. So we need to focus on that to, you know, yeah. offer that help as much as possible, even when the initial response is, no, no, I'm good. Just keep going. Right. right. Absolutely. So, Greg, thank you so much for your time. This has been phenomenal. Please come back as frequently as you like to talk more about the work you're doing, because this is very important work that more people need to know about. Thank you for what you're doing to raise awareness, Wendy. Anytime. So, guys, I'm Wendy Nystrom, your host with Environmental Social Justice. Please check out Greg Gephardt. Please check out Military in Action. We will talk to you soon. Take care. Bye.